a system, metabolites tell us what's happening. They can connect phenotype with the genotype and explain at a given snapshot how, the, how, how an or, or, organism is uh, interacting, different components of uh, an organism are interacting and, they, uh, uh, and responding to the environmental or uh, other triggers present around. So our first presentation is by Professor Jessica Prenny from Colorado State University. Uh, Jessica will tell us what, what's metabolomics, what, what are the challenges there, where the uh, state of the art is, and where the future is heading in the field of metabolomics. Uh, so uh, please welcome Jessica Prani and, and we'll get started. Okay, thank you. Please let me know if there's any issues with my audio or slides. Um, I'm very, everything good? Yes, um, all good. I'm, okay, great. Uh, I'm sorry that I couldn't be there with you guys in person today, but I'm thankful uh, for technology that allows me to still participate. Um, so today I'm going to talk, just give you a brief introduction of the field of metabolomics and discuss some of the challenges that we, uh, that we face that are specific to the study of small molecules. And so we'll start with a few definitions. Um, so metabolomics, what is it? Uh, metabolites uh, can be defined as the biologically active small molecules. So in other words, in a biological system. So in other words, everything other than DNA, RNA, and proteins that you have in a biological system. Uh, the metabolome is a word that we use to describe a collection of metabolites in a biological system. And so sometimes the metabolome can be everything. Um, sometimes the metabolome might describe, you know, for example, a, a subset of the metabolome. Um, for example, if you're talking about plants, you might have the root metabolome or the leaf metabolome. Um, and then metabolomics is the term that we use to describe the analytical method that we use to identify and characterize the metabolome. So why do we do metabolomics? And this was already kind of briefly inter introduced, but really um, the main reason is because metabolites are essentially a functional or chemical readout of a biological phenotype. So again, where genes can tell us the potential of a biological system and transcriptomics and proteomics can tell us what seems to be happening based on the expression of certain functional genes or proteins, uh, the metabolites tell us what is actually happening right now at this particular moment. And in addition, metabolites also are reflective of the environmental influence on uh, a particular phenotype, which is really powerful. So what do I mean by environmental influence? So if we think about the human ecosystem, the environmental influences can include things like the weight of a person, um, where they are in their menstrual cycle, their mood, activity level or lifestyle, um, drug intake and diet, of course, and exposure to pollutants and toxins. Um, and so in addition, while things like medication and diet can influence uh, metabolite production from a human biological pathway perspective, they also result in the presence of exogenous compounds, uh, which just increases the complexity of the human metabolome. So the, the whole metabolome is a combination of endogenous and exogenous um, compounds. And then we can't forget uh, how much of the human ecosystem is actually reflected by the microbes that are living in our guts. And so those microbes also produce small molecules, uh, which is part of the human metabolome. And they also sort of interact and influence with human biological pathways, which produce new uh, metabolites. And then likewise, I always like to remind people that plants are an important part um, of what we do in metabolomics, not just human samples. And so if we're thinking about a plant ecosystem, uh, the environmental influences are gonna be different, but they are gonna include things like the location in which the plant was grown, was it grown in a field or a greenhouse? Um, how much sun or light exposure did that plant get during its growth? Um, the temperature, water or irrigation or lack of irrigation, um, insect pressure, severe weather, and again, soil micro or microbes. And in this case of a plant, the microbes that are living um, in the soil that are interacting with the plant via the roots, um, or also the microbes that are living within the plant. Okay, so we've established metabolites are important to study. Um, and so now we need to think about sort of the challenges around um, how we study metabolites. Um, and so 
the metabolome is very big and it's influenced by the environment, but it's also very diverse in terms of its chemistry. So unlike uh, the other omics, DNA and protein-based omics, where the type of molecules being analyzed is relatively consistent in terms of structure, right? So our friends that are doing genomics have it really easy. They only have four different molecules they have to think about, and all of them are very structurally similar. Uh, proteins, a little bit more diff difficult, right? There's more amino acids to think about. Um, but again, they share the structural similarity of the peptide backbone, which creates an analytical advantage for studying proteins. But when we think about metabolites, right, it's everything else. So these uh, metabolites encompass a very wide range of molecule types uh, that range in polarity, hydrophobicity, and size. And all of that's going to dictate the specific analytical approach that will enable the most effective detection of each type of molecule. Um, and so what this means is that we often have to use a combination of different analytical techniques uh, to detect this diversity of, of chemical types. So the metabolome is very chemically diverse and it's also very large. Um, and so here I've attempted to summarize the, cu the current size of some of our available chemical databases. Um, and this is probably a little bit outdated. I haven't updated this slide in a while, but it gives us an idea of the of the relative size. And so when we think, um, if we focus on specific molecule types, so for example, lipids or those molecules known to be in food or in the human ecosystem, you know, it's a it's a relatively, you know, reasonable number. But as we expand to the world of natural products, um, as represented in the PubChem and the coconut database, the number starts to get really huge. And then if we start trying to predict metabolites just based on simple first order reactions that we know are likely to occur, uh, all of a sudden this number is like outside of the range of what's really manageable to think about. So we're talking about billions of potential compounds. So the chemical space of the metabolome is really, really, really big. And in addition, um, the metabolome also varies a lot across um, species. And so if we're just focusing on humans, um, that's one thing. But many of us are looking not only at metabolomics in humans, but also in other mammals, plant species. And once we get to, uh, and plant species are, um, there's a lot of variability um, in the production of secondary metabolites across plant species and sometimes even within species. Um, and then when once we start thinking about microbial communities, here we're talking about potentially thousands of different species within a community uh, of microbes. And so the metabolome is very diverse in terms of its chemical diversity, but it's also very diverse across species. Okay, so now I've kind of set this up as an almost feel impossible feeling task. Uh, how are we going to tackle this? Um, well, there are a couple of approaches that we use in metabolomics to uh, measure small molecules. And so one option is to do a targeted approach. And so this is actually nothing new. People have been doing this for a long time. Um, and in this type of experiment, we need to know what we're looking for. Um, and then we develop a specific assay to look only for that molecule or that comp list of molecules or metabolites of interest. These assays can be highly specific and sensitive and are capable of generating absolute quantitation, um, assuming we have the appropriate authentic standards uh, and external calibration curves, right? But these are obviously limited because it requires that we already know what we're looking for um, and that we have standards available. So the other option, which is what we're really gonna talk about today, is what we call non-targeted or untargeted metabolomics. And this is really what we think of when we think of omics type of studies, right? So in this case, we're essentially opening up the floodgates and we're detecting everything that we can. Um, although if you know, as nicely illustrated in this, in this picture, even when we do this, we're not capturing everything. And again, that goes back to the chemical diversity of the metabolome. Um, so the other uh, limitation of this approach is that we're, we're detecting peaks. We're just detecting mass spec peaks or features. You might call them called or hear them called features, not specific compounds, right? Because we don't know what we're looking for. Um, and so this is going to require data analysis tools and strategies in order to annotate these peaks as specific biological compounds. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. And then you're going to hear more about that uh, from my colleagues later. Um, and so this type of experiment generates relative quantitation, not absolute. 
Um, but it's clearly the big reason that we're doing this is because it allows for um, novel discoveries. It allows us to look at all those things that we don't yet know are important. And so that's what we're gonna focus on primarily today. And so there are many ways to do a metabolomics experiment, um, but they're always gonna contain these main uh, components of study design, sample collection, processing and extracting samples, um, typically some form of separation, either by liquid or gas chromatography and detection with mass spectrometry, and then data analysis. Um, and so why we like to think of untargeted or non-targeted metabolomics as unbiased, um, in reality, the choices that we make at each of these steps um, is going to bias our experiment to a particular set of metabolites. For example, the solvent that we choose um, is to extract the metabolites the instrument platform, whether we're using liquid or gas chromatography, um, and the tools that we use for data processing. They're going to all have a big influence on what ultimately what we detect uh, and report. And so that's just an important thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about designing an experiment. So if we're going to focus on uh, LCMS experiments, so this is liquid chromatography coupled with high resolution mass spec, which is probably the most commonly used analytical platform. Uh, for metabolomics, um, we can th take a minute to think about what the data structure looks like. And so in this case, right, we have a chromatogram, we have intensity over time. And so for each sample, we're going to have our chromatogram and under each peak in our chromatogram, we're going to have multiple spectra, um, each of which contains multiple features for which we have um, accurate mass, a time, and an intensity. And so at the end of our data acquisition for an experiment, which could involve tens to thousands of samples, we end up with a lot of data over many data files. And so the first step um, of any data analysis is going to be some form of data pre-processing. Um, and this is a hugely important step and includes um, things such as peak picking, um, alignment across samples and retention time correction, um, as well as other steps such as normalization and outlier detection. And there are numerous tools to do this. Um, I've listed a few examples, um, XEMS, MS Dial, and MS, MZ Mine, um, which are open source tools available. There are other open source tools. There are also vendor um, generated or, or commercial tools. Um, but there really isn't, I would, I think it's fair to say there's not a general consensus on what is the best approach to this step. Um, and it definitely remains an active area of research. And so, the output, no matter what tool you're using, the output of this data processing uh, step or data pre-processing step is gonna be some form of data matrix, uh, which includes all of the features or peaks that we've detected, um, which are defined um, with an associated uh, accurate mass and retention time. Um, and then we're going to have a relative or normalized intensity value for each of those features in each of our samples. Um, and that brings us uh, to this grand challenge of metabolomics. And so we don't want to underestimate the importance of that pre-processing step. And even though there are many choices and not a generally sort of accepted uh, best one, um, they all work well. Um, and I think it's fair to say that we can, ge we can generate data really well and easily, and we can get to this point of that data matrix um, pretty routinely. And in fact, our instruments just keep getting faster and more sensitive, and we just keep generating more and more data and higher quality data. Um, but this is where we reach our bottleneck, um, which comes in, which I kind of mentioned at the beginning, which is still our major challenge, which is we have to now, all, all we have at this point is a bunch of peaks and intensities and retention times, but we need to translate this mass spectrometry data into interpretable biological knowledge. And so, just to kind of put this in context, um, I've given this presentation multiple times. And so <laughs> I did a quick Google search when uh, the first time I did this. And I found this paper in 2010 that said, identification of compounds for mass spectrometry is still seen as the major bottleneck in interpretation of MS data. So that was 2010. It is still, it was still the major bottleneck in 2010. And then yesterday I did another Google search and found multiple papers from 2023. Here's an example of one 
where there was a similar quote saying that metabolite, metabolomics annotation challenge remains the bottleneck in metabolomics. And so we this field um, is, is progressing, but we are still facing this major challenge of how do we assign uh, biological names to the peaks that we're detecting in an efficient and accurate way. And so we'll talk a little bit about why this is so hard. So one of the first challenges that we face when we're trying to interpret our data um, is the complexity of the data itself. And so we routinely will detect in a single experiment, depending on what type of instrument you're using, tens or thousands of different peaks uh, in an experiment, of course. Um, and everything that I've kind of talked about so far is implied that each of these peaks corresponds to a different metabolite. But we know, um, best mass spectrometrists, that this is in fact untrue, right? So we expect to see things like isotopes, um, some addict formation, uh, neutral loss uh, from in-source fragmentation. And what I'm showing here is an example of a pure standard of a small molecule, dimethyl succinic acid. Um, and so this might be somewhat of an extreme example, but it nicely illustrates the fact that this, um, the complexity of peaks that you can get from a single sample. And so this particular standard was analyzed, or the data was acquired using the same um, experimental settings, chromatography, everything that we would use for a non-targeted experiment. Um, but this was just a, an, a, a single authentic standard in methanol. And so what we can see here is that our, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor or not. Let's see. Oh, no. Okay. So you can see if you visualize, so the molecular weight of this is 146. So the very, there's a very small peak down there. I actually don't even have it labeled. That corresponds to the N plus H for this molecule. But uh, we see Jessica, a lot Jessica, sorry for interrupting you. We can see yeah. your cursor, so point away. You can see, like, there? We can see it moving. I, I saw it, yep. Oh, okay, so that, so that little peak right there would be the N plus H. Um, and then we also have some addicts, like we have our sodium addict that we can annotate. Um, we have a dimer plus potassium, some neutral losses that we can kind of annotate. But there's still quite a few um, peaks that we, we can't easily assign. Um, uh, an annotation to. And so what this means is that the misinterpretation risk of this data is very high because in a real sample, all of these peaks would be mixed with peaks from other compounds. Um, and so that creates a real risk for misinterpretation. And you might be thinking that this is very odd, but remember again, <clears throat> that our data or the metabolome is very chemically diverse and it, we're trying to see as much as we can. And so essentially what that means is that we use um, instrument settings, our source voltage, like all of the things that we could potentially optimize to get a cleaner spectrum for one individual sample if we were doing a targeted analysis. We, we kind of detune so that we can see as much as possible. So we're not optimizing for any one thing so that we can see a lot. And the result of that often is, is, is things like this. So we have these really complex, uh, we have complex data. And there's actually been quite a lot of work that's been put and thought put into this question of what are we actually detecting in our samples? Um, and I think the general view is that a large majority of the peaks that we actually detect in a given sample could be classified as artifacts. Um, and some reports, and I've put uh, one such report here in as a reference, um, estimate that the percentage of peaks uh, representing actual metabolites is, is less than 5% of, of all the total peaks that we detect in a sample. And so these artifacts uh, include, for example, analytical artifacts, so things from our system, background peaks or contaminants. Um, and as I just illustrated in the previous slide, we can have significant signal degeneracy, meaning that multiple peaks can be detected for a metabolite due to addict formation, neutral loss, isotopes, and multimer formation. And so this remains an ongoing challenge, but there's also been significant effort and work um, done to recognize and address this complexity. Um, and so these include uh, simple approaches like subtraction of their background signal um, or extraction using extraction blanks. Um, 
We have computational approaches that focus on the identification and assignment of common peak pair relationships. And so I've listed a couple examples of, of tools that do this, like camera and interpret MS. Um, we, there are also tools that look at correlational clustering um, and retention time and correlational clustering. So that's using um, coevolution and also um, the quantitative data of peaks across the uh, quantitative relationship of peaks across a data set uh, to identify which peaks might be related to the same um, metabolite. Um, and so a couple examples of those, again, camera and RAMCLUST, um, but there are others as well. And then there has been approaches that have used um, stable isotope um, labeling in order to help us identify the real biological system in a sample. So examples of that would be IORA or credentialing and as well as others. And none of these are 100% perfect or necessarily um, appropriate for every experimental design. Um, and they're not 100% perfect because we don't actually know what 100% perfect is because this is non-targeted and there's a lot of unknowns and we don't know what we're looking for. So it's kind of the circular circular challenge. Um, but of all these strategies, the goal is the same, right? So we wanna reduce the complexity as much as we can um, and reduce the number of individual features in a data set to more accurate, accurately represent uh, biological metabolites that are detected. Okay, so at this point, everything I've talked about so far though is only um, basically a list of feature or feature groups uh, with accurate mass and retention time that represent metabolites. Um, and as you and the audience likely know, we rely on fragmentation to provide structure specific information uh, to enable a metabolite identification. And so here I'm just illustrating the value of this um, for four molecules which have the same exact molecular uh, weight, so they're structural isomers, but clearly have very, very different um, MSMS or fragmentation spectra, which will allow us to distinguish them um, in addition to retention time if there's if we can separate them by retention time um, in a in a data set full of unknowns. And so we rely a lot on this MSMS data to help us with our identification process. And so to set the stage a little bit for discussing how we can annotate um, our MSMS spectra, and this term annotate is just something that we use in the field, and that's, to, that's the word that we use to describe the process of saying, of assigning a biological compound name to a, a feature or a set of features in a spectrum. Um, so I thought I'd start by pre presenting this generalized overview of, of how we think about and report our confidence in annotation. Um, and so this figure kind of represents how I like to think about this. Um, and it's a combination of what was originally presented in um, 2007 by the Metabolomic Standards Initiative. And then there was some re additional uh, updates to this idea in 2014 um, uh, by this paper here, Shemansky et al. But there's also been others that have proposed um, different uh, approaches to determining or reporting metabolite annotation. Um, and so, and I think there are still ongoing discussions about what these specific levels should look like, but there's general agreement that as we move from level one, which would be what we consider a confirmed structure, um, to level five, which is basically just uh, an exact mass or a, an unknown. Um, so we have the decreasing confidence as we move from level one to level five. And I would say that there probably, there really is no one exact um, perfect way to report this, but the important thing is um, deciding on how you are going to report your confidence and then uh, being very transparent about that when you do report your confidence. Okay, so let's start with level one. So level one is the most confident way that we can assign a biological uh, identity to our data. And that is to compare our experimental data uh, for an authentic standard to um, our, our experimental data to that of an authentic standard that was analyzed and um, on the same exact analytical platform. Um, and so in this example here, we can compare both uh, retention time. So here's our, our peak, here's our sample, our unknown, and here's our authentic standard. So we can compare retention time, and then we can also compare our MSMS spectra. So again, on top, we have 
the experimental sample, and on the bottom we have our standard. And so while this is considered the gold standard for identification, it is uh, by no means high throughput or fast. Um, and it requires that we have authentic standards available for what our candidate um, compounds are, and that's not always the case. So if we move down to the next step, which is level two, which is by far what most of the annotations in the literature from non-targeted metabolomics are, um, this involves um, comparison or searching of our experimental data to spectral libraries. And so these are libraries that are generated by other people and other labs, um, but still based on the analysis of authentic standards. And this can be a relatively high throughput approach. It can be automated. Um, however, it's been estimated that it's uh, that only about 10% of known human metabolites are represented in spectral libraries right now. And so even though we can do this, we're still only searching a small um, sort of subset of the potential metabolite space. And that's just of the known metabolites uh, in the human system. Um, this is gonna be a much smaller number when we're talking about uh, plant metabolites or microbial metabolites. So in this case, we're still um, basing our identification um, on the frag matching the fragmentation spectrum of our sample um, against that from an authentic standard that is in a spectral library. Um, but again, the standards are not available for many of the compounds and um, generating these um, comprehensive spectral libraries. When we think about the ultimate size of the metabolome across all the species that we might want to analyze, it's really, it's a pretty intractable idea to think that we're ever going to have spectral libraries for, uh, for all the potential compounds that we could detect. So just to kind of dive a little bit deeper into this concept of mass spectral libraries, um, I've listed here, and again, these might be slightly outdated, a few of the common mass spectral library uh, databases that are available for us to use. Some of these um, are open source, some are, are commercial, um, but in general, it gives you an idea of the types or the number of spectra that are in these types of databases, right? And so... For example, and then it looks like the NIST spectra or the NIST database um, has a ton of spectra, which it does, um, right? So over 10 to the six. But it's important to realize that if we look at an, uh, an example of an entry for, um, in this case, I'm showing the entry for tryptophan uh, from the NIST library, uh, we can see that for one compound, we have actually 36 different spectra uh, in the library. So this number of spectra does not correspond to different metabolites, um, and this is the case across all of the um, uh, across all of the uh, libraries. And this illustrates, uh, or further illustrates, sort of the intractability of doing this for every potential metabolite, right? Because um, if you analyze tryptophan on a FT instrument versus a triple quad versus a QTOP, you're going to get slightly different spectra. Um, and it's also going to depend on the collision energy. So you can see that multiple collision energies are represented here and whether or not you're analyzing, you're detecting this compound in positive or negative mode. So a good spectral database is going to um, analyze that standard using multiple instruments under multiple instrument conditions so that it's valuable to different labs that are using different, um, different analytical platforms. Okay, so given the complexity and scale that we've talked about um, and the fact that this sort of generating these spectral libraries comprehensive of all metabolites is, is really pretty intractable at this point in time, um, the only way to really increase our ability to an annotate more of our data is through development of computational mass spectrometry approaches, um, which enable uh, tentative identification when spectra from standards are not available. And so these approaches can be rule-based or quantum chemistry-based, or they can utilize statistical or machine learning approaches. Um, and I, there's been huge strides. This is a very active area of research um, and a real testament to collaborative efforts between uh, mass spectrometrists and analytical scientists like myself and our computational colleagues. <clears throat> 
And so there are multiple approaches for doing this. Um, and I'll just give you a couple of uh, examples of, of how these work. Um, and I will also preface this by saying I'm not a computational person, so I'm not the expert here, but maybe there are some folks in the audience that would be uh, more able to add, answer specific questions on these tools. Um, but let's say one approach um, for doing this is similar to what we do in proteomics, if you're, in, if you're uh, familiar with that approach. And this is where we might start with a database of structures, and then we generate a database of pre predicted in silico spectra. And then we can query our experimental spectra against this predicted spectra and look for the best match. So very similar to what we do in proteomics. Um, and so we create this database of in silico spectra, we do our spectral matching. An example of this approach would be CFM ID. Um, and they use machine learning to generate the predicted spectra from chemical structures. And so another approach is that we might start with the experimental data um, and then use the neutral accurate mass of the parent ion to generate a list of predicted candidate structures. Um, and then we take we generate predicted fragments for just these predicted candidate structures. And then we base our putative identification on how much of the experimental spectra we can explain with these in silico fragments from the selected candidates. And so an example of this is MetFrag. And so in addition to the, those two approaches, even though they were different fundamentally in how they're working, they're still sort of based on this concept of traditional spectral searching. Um, but another example of how we can use computational mass spectrometry is through an approach called chemical networking. And so this process involves iterative pairwise spectral alignments that create networks of spectral relationships. Um, and this can be done within your own data set um, or against spectral libraries or data from other uh, people's experiments um, that have been deposited in a, repos a public repository. And so these spectral relationships are based on spectral similarity, and thus they're another tool for helping us annotate unknowns. Um, we can use this approach to, uh, the, the value of this approach is that it doesn't require an exact spectral match, just a similarity. And so often we can enable uh, propagation of annotations um, to similar molecules. Um, and so these uh, annotations are often maybe at the chemical class level, um, but they give us, they allow us to take advantage of the fact that similar molecules are gonna have similar um, fragmentation spectra. And sometimes that is really valuable uh, into how we interpret our data. Okay, so I just wanna, so these computational tools really, I think are the future of metabolomics and how we're gonna be able to make headway in really breaking into this, this space of um, all of those uh, unknown metabolites or all of the things that we don't have standards for. But an important note is that all of these approaches, um, you know, they don't just say like, yay, I've identified your compound, here it is, and I'm 100% confident. They return a rank list of candidates or putative identifications. And so there's this so scoring is a challenge. How do we know which one is the right one? How do we separate the correct from the incorrect candidates? Um, and that I think is a, is a magic bullet question still. Um, so there's been some um, benchmarking studies that have been done. Um, and so to look at like how well are we doing, right? So a lot of these tools have their own way of, of, doing, challenge, of doing scoring and deciding which is, is the right answer. Um, and so, uh, there's been these benchmarking studies uh, called CASME, and there's been multiple of these. Um, and so this quote is from the uh, CASME study that was done in 2016. Um, so this was basically all of the people that uh, wanted to participate could test their computational uh, annotation approaches against a the same set of, of experimental data. And then they would return the results and then the, the organizers of these studies would compare and sort of see how the field was doing uh, as a whole. And from that study, um, basically it said that the best methods were able to achieve about 30% of top one ranks, which meant, which means 30% of the time, the correct answer was the top candidate, top scoring candidate using whatever method the, the people were using. And then within all the methods, um, 
the top, uh, the correct candidate that the right answer was in the top 10, about 50% of the time. So if you look at this the other way, if 30% of the time the, the, the correct answer was in the top, was the top candidate, that means that 70% of the time it was not. Um, and if we think about the number, um, the size of these data sets, right? So we have thousands of unknowns and we're using these high throughput computational tools to predict our metabolite annotations. There's no way, it's really like impossible to think that, you know, to go through every single, you know, thousands of, of these annotations and manually examine all top 10 of these annotations and decide which one's the best one. And so oftentimes researchers will just take the top one, which means that they're only 30% accurate who are doing this. And there was a more recent update um, to this uh, benchmarking study. So this was just uh, recently presented. So this was a 2022 study. And I put the link for the results of this study if anybody wants to look at it in more detail. Um, but they did a very similar thing where they invited people to test their tools on the same data set. Um, and in this case, they looked at more than just uh, the ultimate correct annotation. They looked at how well these tools could identify or assign addicts to uh, a molecular ion, um, how accurately they could assign a molecular formula, uh, chemical class, and then finally our 2D structure or that like ultimate annotation. And this to me is a little bit more um, encouraging, right? So it says that these tools are really doing a good job at uh, identifying addicts, that we're, we're really pretty good at um, identifying, at calculating the molecular formula. That's great. Um, we can assign chemical class around 70% of the time accuracy, but we're still hovering around that 30% accuracy point for um, the ultimate um, sort of annotation, correct annotation. So one thing that we can do to increase our confidence and annotation from these computational approaches is that we can leverage other data that we have. Um, so for example, if we're choosing between a list of ranked candidate identifications, we can prioritize uh, the more likely candidates based on the number of scientific references mentioning the compound. Um, although of course that we have to be aware that this can introduce some bias. And so, but this is really valuable, especially when um, you're looking at, for example, known biological systems. Um, we can also utilize uh, the correlation of retention time and log P, although this is not as accurate as, as it is when we're doing GC separations. Um, it can serve as a filter for prioritizing candidates. And then um, finally, oops, as we um, often do in proteomics, again, we can use uh, more focused or smaller databases, or uh, so we can narrow down our search space, um, which is a term sometimes people use, they call suspect stringing. And so um, in this particular paper here, I'm, or I'm showing some data here or on the right that I pulled from a paper from 2016 where the authors utilized um, the in silico uh, approach of METFRAG to generate a ranked list of candidates, and then saw that by increasing the number, um, by including the number of scientific references and also retention time, they were able to improve uh, their identification of the correct compound um, pretty significantly from around 20% to uh, close to 90%. So that is a promising solution. And an additional tool that we can use to improve metabolite annotation is ion mobility separation. Um, to measure collisional cross-sections. So ion mobility provides an additional level of separation that's reflective of the three-dimensional size of our molecules. Um, and from ion mobility separation, we can determine a molecule's collisional cross-section, which is a value that's more reproducible across labs than retention time. And so the figure here that I'm showing you on the right um, is taken from uh, this publication that I cited down here, um, where it was one of the early descriptions um, where we can utilize uh, small molecule collisional cross-sections, um, cross-section libraries based on experimentally determined uh, collisional cross-section values. And so in this figure, they illustrate one of the values of ion mobility separation, where you can see these two compounds, which have pretty much the same nominal mass um, that can be easily separated by, by ion mobility. So we, we have some 
accurate mass separation, but we have, but we may not have uh, chromatographic separation, but we, if we utilize ion mobility, we can easily tell these two compounds apart. And so um, I also want to say a quick note about data repositories. Um, and so these are really important part of our metabolomics infrastructure for sharing experimental data. Um, I've listed a few examples of the larger repositories that are out there now. Um, and depositing our experimental data is required now by many journals, um, and it enables a citable permanent source for your data. Um, and importantly, sharing of our data and will enable reanalysis, um, which I think ultimately will be critical as our tools continue to improve um, and also enable some comparison of our data. So I just want to end with some take home messages um, and then I'm happy to answer some questions. Um, so take home messages, metabolomics is extremely powerful technology um, and that it is as reflective of our biological phenotype and also the influence of the environment on that biological phenotype. Um, there are a lot of unique analytical and computational challenges in metabolomics that are sort of unique to metabolomics as compared to other omics. And this is due to the chemically comple chemical complexity and also just the sheer size of the metabolome. Um, I wanna reiterate that even though we like to think of non-targeted metabolomics as unbiased, all of the choices that you make in your experimental design, your choice of analytical tools and how you process your data will impact and bias your results. And so it's just really important to be mindful of uh, how you design your experiment at all steps of it and be very transparent in how this is reported in the literature. And then finally, that confident metabolite annotation uh, remains 13 years later, our grand challenges in, in metabolomics, but there's huge strides being made um, towards this using computational uh, approaches, as well as continuing to increase our metabolite libraries and repositories. Okay, so thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. I will stop sharing. Okay, so thank you, Jessica. Um, so I, I think if you have questions, if we want Jessica to see you, I'm understanding that you can go to the podium and you can turn on the microphone. Who wants to go first? <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> it's a big barrier, but uh, come on, someone's <laughs> got to do it. Go, go, go. Yeah, you can go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 go here. Hi, Jessica. Thank you very much. Nice talk. So I have a uh, few questions. Um, for example, uh, data depository uh, resources. So like uh, I mean, Metabolomics Workbench, uh, this is a pretty new tool, right? And the NIT recommend to deposit metabolomics data, lipidomics data into that data resource. So once we deposit the data, do you know if you know the group of um, Metabolic Workbench share that data resource with other publicly available data resource, or it's only kept in the one resource, or how do you guys manage yeah, that's those a important really, resources? That's, mm -hmm, that's a really, really good question. I think it's one of the um, maybe things that the field needs to to, to figure out, right? Because there are multiple repositories and some of them are can interact and some of them cannot. And so, um, it, so I think the answer to your question is that it depends which one, and I'm actually not sure with metabolomics or metabolite workbench, um, if that one is cross-referenced to others, but I think you bring up a really good point that we don't have, it's not like genomics data where it's like everything goes into NCBI, right? So there are other, there are multiple databases that people are using and that's just kind of the state of where we're at right now. Okay, thank you. And then one more question is how, how about uh, yeah. imaging mass spec data? So it's a file size is you know, 70 gigabyte, 100 gigabyte, sometimes 300 gigabyte, but we analyze you know, a metabolite or repeat. So can I just deposit such a big file into you know, those publicly available, available you know, repository resource or? Uh, 
I, I think so. Um, I mean, our files are pretty big. They're not that big, but I think so. I don't know. You'd have to go and look, but I would think that, that, that you should and, and could and can. So okay, last question is how much I can trust those, you know, uh, resource, how NIH support this however, but, you know, sometimes, you know, for example, I used to use some another resource, I double the data, but once NIH found stopped, they you know, kind of, you know, there's no update. So I'm just, you know, curious and worry about, you know, even though I contribute, deposit those data, if funding stop, how, you know, those communities support such a useful, you know, resource? Uh, you mean for the repository? Yeah, yeah. Well, and other resources, yeah, you know. I don't have the answer to that, but I think it's a fair question to ask. But I think that all of the data repositories that from all of the omics are going to are face face a similar challenge, right? If the funding goes away, um, who's going to who's going to support yeah. it, and what happens to your data? Um, but I think we just have to to hope that those would be continue to be uh, supported. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, Jessica, Neha, wonderful presentation, thank you. Thank uh, you. I have a question on the artifact analysis. You mentioned that majority of the metabolome is artifacts and then we, if we remove them, then we get to the core metabolome. There was, during mm -hmm. COVID, Nadia Czech and Roger Lennington came together and they did a really cool study which was published in JNP where they compared the data from Orbitrap and I think Synap2, I forgot which version of mm -hmm. Synap, water Synap, TAF instrument, and they highlighted that they saw uh, um, many more features, as we know, in Orbitrap as compared to TOF. But what they highlighted, the con one of the conclusions of the paper was that majority of the features that were detected in Orbitrap, not in TOF for metabolomics, not for proteomics, uh, <laughs> were actually addicts. Uh, so, so, so basically, depending upon what instrument you're using, the number of artifacts you see are very different. Like in TOF, they were less. In Orbitrap, they were more. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, well, I'm very familiar with that study, and it's a really nice paper um, for those of you that want to read it. Um, I, I mean, my thoughts are that I'm not surprised at all, and we've seen similar things. And even in our lab, we have different types of TOF instruments. Um, we see more sort of in-source fragmentation on, for example, our Synapt instrument than on our Zebo instrument. And so... Um, I think that the answer is I'm not surprised at all, and I think that that's one of the reasons that uh, this is this is so, so challenging, um, is that every instrument you can analyze the same sample on different instruments, and you're going to see different peaks, um, and and then have to figure out what's the right thing. But that I encourage you to to read that paper because it is really nice, uh, nicely described and presented. Go for it, Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Jessica. This is Joe Lou here. Hi, Joe. You should be here. I don't know why you're not here. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, so I'm new to this area, and I, I thought your talk was really illuminating, but it I found it a little bit discouraging from, from an outside point of view. I just find it so complex that you can only identify maybe 10% of the human metabolites known. And if you just try to design the experiment, you need to do positive ion, negative ion, I don't know how many different phases of chromatography, and you're gonna get different results from every type of mass spectrometer you ever use. And so how do you convince collaborators or people who, are, who come to you and say, we can give you some useful information based on what you kind of told the class, that it's really challenging. What's, how, do you, yeah. how do you convince them that, that you can give them something useful? Right, and I, uh, I, I apologize. I didn't mean to be a Debbie Downer. Uh, <laughs> and I always struggle with that when I give this presentation, but really the, the, the I think as, a, as, a, as an analytical chemist and as a collaborator, you know, we're often collaborating with people and, um, so I find myself having to um, sort of recalibrate expectations, I think, um, uh, with my, with my uh, collaborators. 
And I think the way that we do that is is by making them aware of the challenges. So that is my intention. And um, because I think when the field of metabolomics first started, we didn't necessarily recognize uh, all of these challenges. And so there's a lot of literature out there that um, maybe uh, overestimates what we're the confidence of which we're detecting all of, of all of these things in our samples. And then our biological collaborators might go read those papers and say, hey, I want you to identify like, you know, 3000 metabolites for me. It was kind of the same with proteomics, if you remember when, yeah. when proteomics first got started until yeah. we, we, you know, got rid of the one hit wonders and things. Um, and so my, my, my message to my collaborators is, is that it's better to go in with some sort of sort of a hypothesis. Like I know that I am interested in, um, you know, soluble metabolites, water, you know, polar metabolites. And so I'm going to design my experiment to focus on a specific type of metabolites. And I'm going to choose a search space. I'm going to use these tools um, and then and then use my own knowledge about what's in the sample to help me focus in on what I'm, um, you know, the database that I'm using to search again or the candidate spectra. Um, and then I am very transparent with how I present data in terms of I'm very confident in these, I'm less confident in these. I think there's a lot of value in the chemical class identifications in terms of when we're just trying to get a big idea of like biologically what's happening in this system. Um, and so I put a lot of emphasis on that as well. Um, but I, th there is still huge value in, and that's why we're all still doing this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, in metabolomics. I was thinking if I was 20 years younger, I'd be jumping into the metabolomics because as an analytical scientist, there's so much, there's so much to investigate so much. to prove it. And so for the younger people out there, if you're an analytical scientist, this is like, this is a golden age. This is an opportunity for you to contribute to the field. If you're a biologist, I'm not really sure, but I think, but, but I think, I think Jessica, I think is really giving some really good advice to target your question to what can be done. And then maybe the field will improve. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Jess. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, Jessica. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I would just yeah. add to the discussion. I, I feel like um, we do, uh, it's a great challenge here for analytical chemists. Um, but I also feel like, you know, I have colleagues that use a mass spectrometer to measure 100 metabolites. They have standards. Mm -hmm. And with that one assay, they can do a ton of things, right? So we all want to do everything because it's technically cool and we really need want to get there. But I do think we um, often undervalue um, how much impact uh, just knowing the, the precise amount of a few uh, metabolites could be on a particular well-focused biological question. So I just wanted to throw that in there. Yes, thank you for saying that, Josh. Yeah. Sure. Uh, Last call on the on the podium. We've had lots of takers, but uh, three of them have been uh, speakers. One one uh, student. Let's have one more student come on up and ask a question. Anybody? Okay, come on up. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Jessica. Nice talk. Thank you. Um, my question is. Uh, you talk about the metabolome is difficult because of we're dealing with so many metabolites. But I think another layer of complexity comes from they're very, very different in terms of concentrations. So the yes. idea that, you know, we have a single injection, single sample will give us, you know, all the metabolites. I, I just think, you know, the, the concentration is really a problem because many metabolites are intermediates. They're not to, they're not supposed to exist in very high concentration. That's make them hard to detect. So my question really is, do we have a sense the rough, you know, um, concentration range for metabolites and what is our current limit on instrument or technology? Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a really, really good point, and you're absolutely correct. Um, 
And I think that the answer to your question is it depends on the, the instrument platform, of course. I would say in general, um, I don't know, and maybe jo Josh can jump in here and, and add from his expertise with uh, Orbitrap instruments on tops, I would say probably, you know, maybe around five orders of magnitude in range. Um, you know, and it also really depends on if compounds are co-eluding or not, um, on whether or not you can see them. And so uh, I think it, it depends on the, the platform. And of course, if you're interested in really low uh, concentration compounds, that's again where you can target your sample prep, for example, and look at only uh, so, you know, what, you know, methanol soluble compounds or non, or, you know, do a lipid extraction, or um, you could even do some fractionation similar to approaches that are done in, in, um, in proteomics if you really want to target those low abundance compounds. But you're absolutely right. And I actually, I'll add one more thing. And so this kind of supports or goes back to what Josh just mentioned. Um, and this is, again, uh, something I often tell collaborators too, is that there is value in sort of stepping back and not trying to see everything and just saying like, I wanna look at the screen for this panel of, of, of compounds that I know are important, which is sort of a hybrid between our non-targeted and targeted approaches. Um, and in that case, there is also value um, because sometimes you can increase your sensitivity for some of those really low abundance compounds.